Yeah. Surprise, a little different than you used to. Yeah. Dropping these bars on YouTube, knowledge I introduce you. Yeah. We chasing this money like it's the prize, it's the voodoo. Fugazi, Fugazi, it's just a lie we buying into. Uh, yeah. We need some cars on deck. Get yeah. the rollies, get the mowing, all the Mars on deck. Good evening, how are we doing? All right, so there's a number of you already in here. This is the finance clinic, so uh, we're going to spend maybe an hour roughly, um, just taking questions, answering some questions, trying to be as helpful as possible, really. I know that uh, there are already some questions that have been posted prior to us beginning. Um, I should be able to add these into the chat as we get around to them. Bear me one second, I need to change something over. Um, there we go. This is the right one. Okay. So, um, just to obviously do the housekeeping, I always say this, but if you do get value from this, please consider smashing the like button. It just means that other people who may be seeking answers to these questions that you're going to be asking me this evening, uh, can also get the benefit of maybe watching this video and getting the answer because the YouTube algorithm will basically recommend this video to them, uh, after this stream is live. So thank you so much for joining me. We're going to jump straight into it this evening, uh, starting with uh, a couple of questions here from Missy London. Um, I'm remortgaging from a residential repayment to a buy-to-let interest only. Will a bank be more likely to approve the remortgage on a five-year than a two-year fixed rate? Um, also applied for a consent to let, which was not approved. Could one single arrears in mortgage payment affect this? And after paying off the arrears, will it will it still affect the new buy to let application? Okay, so I think how have you done this? You need to speak to um, you really do need to speak to your. They should have given you a reason as to why the consent to let wasn't um, wasn't approved. Arrears may do that if you pay it off then you should be okay. But things like arrears is going to remain on your record for like five, six years because it goes onto your credit score, basically. So you're always going to have that issue. But if you pay it off, what they might do is they might risk rate you. So they might give you, make sure that, may, well, they might make you pay a higher rate on the mortgage. But I think that this one is really the one to kind of just bear in mind more than anything else, really, to be honest. Um, if you're going from a residential to a buy to let, you need to, well, you can't go from a residential per se to a buy to let. They have to give you a, a consent to, to let effectively. If they've said no to that, then technically speaking, you will be in breach of your mortgage contract, your mortgage deed, if you still rented the place out. Um, so you need to be a little bit careful there, to be honest. Whether or not they'll approve a five-year or two-year fixed rate, the, the the product that you choose isn't really going to have that much of a of an indication of it of a weighting. Um, what they're going to be looking at is right. What's the what's the length of the mortgage overall? What's your income like? Um, can you afford to make these payments? Uh, do you have enough headroom in your expenses in your income? Do you have a good track record? That's what they're going to be concerned about. Picking a two-year or five-year fixed rate in my head, doesn't make any difference at all to what they're going to be looking at on the application form. I would want to know why they've um, declined to give you a consent to let. If it is because of the arrears, then you need to ask them a direct question. Look, I'll pay this off. What are the chances that you'll, that you'll approve it after I paid off the, the arrears? They might turn around and say, well, it's going to be down to underwriting, which means that they can't tell you, they don't know, or at least the person you're speaking to doesn't know. It would have to go through to underwriters. Technically, it probably will help you, um, but it's hard to say without knowing full context at this point in time. That may not give you the full answer that you want, but hopefully it... Uh, it helps a little bit, hopefully. Um, right, I'm in the process of transferring my Nest pension to my current employer's pension scheme with the intention of investing in the Aegon BlackRock World Excluding UK Equity Index. In my previous... Mm, hang on one second, where am I? In my previous, so the Nest you're talking about here, totally 0.06. Additionally... 
you contribute 5% of your income or your employer contributes 12, 7% or so 12% combination through wage sacrifice. It was worth n- noting that all allocations are set at 100%. That's good. Uh, I'm currently 36 years old. I would greatly appreciate your opinion on this matter. Uh, Nest, You're saying here, Nest Pension, I had allocated all my investments to the Nest Higher Risk Fund. Nest charges a fee of 0.3%. And the best of my understanding, my employee's pension only involves fund fees. Only employs fund fees. I mean, I think if you're going from Nest to your, I mean, Aegon are pretty good as a provider. They're very, very good. They're quite low cost as well. Um, you're, you've got 12% going in. So that's always going to be a, a good thing. Um See, I don't necessarily have the greatest opinion of the Nest, the performance that Nest basically provides, because I don't know, they, the, the choices aren't that great. You're going to have a greater um, breadth of choice at Aegon, effectively. The only thing that I would compare would be the fees. But then again, in this whole conversation, if you were to compare it, you're not like the fees from Nest to Aegon, Nest is probably going to be a bit cheaper. Aegon will probably be a bit more expensive, right? So in my head, if you're going to make the decision based on fees alone, I don't think it's the right comparison to make because then you'd have to go a step further and really start to have a look at that tra- track record of, of the fund. So the high-risk fund with Nest and then the one that you're choosing with Aegon. I would probably argue without even looking at it that the Aegon performance would be better than the Nest performance. And obviously it's important to note that Past performance is no indication of future performance, but because Aegon have more, I guess, capabilities as a as a fund investment manager, I would prob I would go with them personally, purely because you've got more scope and you've got more expertise at your disposal. And yes, you might pay a little bit extra for that, but the fact that you're transferring it to your employees' workplace as well it makes sense because you're consolidating, right? You're getting it into one place. So if you were to leave your employer and you were to move from, you know, this Aegon part into your new employers, for example, if you get head on or just decide to leave, at least you're taking your pensions with you wherever you go. So I think it looks good. I think it looks good. Um, I would encourage you though, your employer will probably have a rep, um, with the administrators being Aegon. So maybe try and have a little chat with them. Uh, Pick up the phone, have a little chat with them and see if they can maybe do a comparison between the Nest High Risk Fund and the Aegon BlackRock that you're you're picking. And just say, look, how would you compare the the past performance between the two? They wouldn't be able to give you any advice or anything like that because they're not allowed to, but they can give you some hard, like hard data to have a look at. But I don't see anything wrong with what you're thinking about there. I think it, it's pretty cool. Nest is great, but yeah, they can be a little lackluster. Jadamel, thank you so much, dude. Your books, so I've not been able to post them this weekend. Your books are going to go up first thing tomorrow morning, my friend. Thank you so much. I did get the message yesterday. I was in Manchester, drove back. Uh, it was a little bit late. And then today, I've just was knackered. <laughs> so I've taken a little bit of a, a slow Sunday. But I'll be posting them up first thing on Monday. Thank you for the super chat. Really do appreciate you. Thank you very, very much. Clinton. Clinton saying here, hi, Pete. I believe I nearly have enough for a deposit for a house in my area. I'd like to move due to uh, the house me and my family are in being too small in terms of bedrooms. Also, also the issue is I also, you're typing, so I'm going to wait. You might be asking whether or not um, it would be a good idea. I mean, I think ultimately you've got to have a look around your local um, market, property market, see what you can find. Best thing to do, speak to uh estate agents and stuff really to be honest and have you got an understanding of how much you can borrow yet that's going to be the next thing um especially because some of the uh, affordability criteria may have changed with some of the the lenders now so you probably want to get a nice understanding of your lending criteria whether you pass how much you can borrow that kind of stuff because when you go looking around for properties as well um just knowing that you can go and shop in this bracket of properties will make a huge difference than not knowing in the first place. You can be a bit more focused and targeted on where you're going with it as well. So 
I'm going to wait for you to finish typing. In the meantime, I just want to say a big, big thank you. So I'm looking at this, the subscriber count at the moment. We're 18 to get to 42,100. Again, you know, subscriber numbers are a little bit of a vanity, but at the same time, they do show channel growth. And it, it's I, it's stupidly one of, the, one of the main things that I can look at to see whether or not what we do on the channel kind of resonates or not people clicking the subscribe or, you know, uh, clicking the like button is a, is a big indicator as to is something working? Do people find value in it or is it just not worthwhile doing? Um, and so to see the, the subscriber count go up quite a bit has been very, very encouraging. And I think at this rate, we'll probably get to 42,100 in the next day or so. So I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who, um, who has subscribed certainly over the past couple of days, because I think yesterday we were somewhere in like the twenties or something like that. I think we were. So quite a few people have joined over the last uh, 24 hours, 48 hours or so since Friday. So thank you so much for being here. So in the finance clinic, what we tend to do is we uh, spend some time. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to ask your question. So if you pop your question in the comments, I will get to it and uh, give you an answer as best as I possibly can to try and help you um, essentially make the best decision or at least give you something to think about, maybe research or something to do tomorrow if you feel like you're in a bit of a bind or you're, you're stuck or you need a second opinion. Um, so if you do have questions, by all means, uh, pop them in the chat and I will get round to them. Uh, we have about 50 minutes left on this show, roughly, for this evening. Uh, we do this, I try to say every Sunday, I didn't do it last Sunday because I was in uh, I was in, in Greece uh, for a wedding. Um, but now that I'm around, we'll do this every every Sunday if we can and answer, answer questions for you. So if you do have questions, be sure to pop them in the uh, comment section and we'll get through it together. Uh, I'm just having a look through here. Uh, Missy just saying here. Pete, have you had any? Have you ever had any expect experiences of dealing with the new bank tide, either personally or through clients opening bank accounts for buy to let? Are they a good bank? I don't have any experience working with them at all, um, so I can't really give any kind of view on what they're like or what their service is like because I, I don't I don't use them and I don't know anyone who has used them I think there was um we I was thinking of using them for a business account a while back but I didn't use them in the end I used Starling because I'm with Starling and it's just so much easier with Starling to open an account so I couldn't tell you um can you tell me in the comment please if you can Missy London who are you with in terms of this mortgage that you're trying to move from residential to buy to let? And have you only applied with one lender? Or are you doing multiple applications right now? Or you so have you been have you been told no? And then you're trying to try and find someone else. Can you let me know in the comments, please? And I'll circle back to that. Do I recommend any new or challenger banks? Um for mortgages, for mortgages, I think you should go and speak to a mortgage provider, a, a mortgage broker. Okay, don't go to a provider. And I'll give you the reason why. If you go to a provider like Tide or HSBC or Barclays, you have to meet their criteria. So they will have a stringent set of rules of the kind of uh, mortgages they will write and the number of mortgages they will write. And the criteria might be you need to show uh, six months worth of statements. You need to be in employment uh, in a full-time contract for at least 12 months. You can't be on probation or anything like that. They will have their own set of rules. Now, if you go into like a Tide or a HSBC or a Barclays, you have to meet their rules, their criteria specifically. Whereas if you go with a mortgage broker, what a broker basically does is there are over 200 of these tides hsbcs all with different names like there's there's hundreds of them a mortgage broker an independent one a good one will go out to all of the lenders and what they try to do is they at least try to match the lender to your criteria not the opposite way around so if you're if you're if you're stuck right now 
you need to speak to a mortgage broker, an independent mortgage broker or mortgage advisor. And some of them may charge you up front, but trust me, it will be worthwhile paying because if you get a really, really good one, they will find out the best lender for you. So that would be my advice in opposed to trying to go to specific lenders because you have to meet their criteria and they're not really incentivized to, to move or budge for you if you don't meet their criteria. It's like, this is what we want to do. This is the criteria that we set. They're not going to budge and they're not going to move for anyone. People, For them, they've got an entire market of people just applying to them every single day. So their rules are their rules, essentially. Um, you're saying mortgage currently with Barclays um, and have to stick with them due to circumstances. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is where it becomes a little bit more difficult because Barclays now you have to meet the Barclays criteria, basically. And, you know, they can play hardball with you. I've I've known people who have um, been in similar situations where it's like, I can't move because I just can't. And then I had one, for example, they also wanted to get a consent to, lent, uh, to let, and they charged them, like, I think it was like a thousand pounds just to get it approved in terms of a fee. And it was like, it's because they can they've got you as a captive audience uh, audience effectively so the power's in their hands a little bit sean's just asking here pete can you transfer out of your current company pension say 95 percent, into one with a better choice of funds keep paying in so not to close company contributions but transfer out annually yes some companies will allow you to do it some companies won't they some, so it's called partial transfers. So some companies will allow you to partially transfer. Others won't allow you to partially transfer. So that's a question that you need to ask. Um, maybe your HR, get inf the information for your administrator, your pension administrator, and see if they will. Some of them may have limits that you need to keep in there. So some of them will say that, okay, you, need, you can transfer out 50% per year, but you need to have 50% here because some of them will have some of them might have uh, minimum account balances that you need to hold for charges. Um, so yeah, you can do it with some, some don't, but it's worthwhile asking. That was a follow on Sean. So I think we've, we've covered and encapsulated that hopefully, if not, just let me know. Adam, how you doing? Hi, Peter. Is it possible slash is there any drawbacks to periodically moving funds from company auto enrollment pension to a SIP? So kind of what we were talking about before with Sean's question, you, you can, but look, this is the thing, right? A SIP is a self-invested personal pension. And I think people sometimes get confused with personal pensions and SIPs. SIPs, SIPs, they are kind of the same, but you know, for me, if someone says, I want to SIP, I would be asking you with my advisor hat on whether you actually need a SIP or a personal pension. There's a difference. So SIPs are, are a great vehicle if you are a company owner where you want to put in um, assets that don't necessarily fit within the normal structures of a pension uh, fund. So for example, commercial property. Right. So if you're a company, you're a company director, your own company, you own your office block, you can basically put your office block into your pension. And the main way you would do that is if you use the SIP. So if you're not a company director, because of the um, uh, the, the extra um, functionalities within the SIP, SIPs can be expensive, more expensive than personal pensions, because you get that additional um, functionality. And above that, with a SIP, the SIP dictates uh, the rules for the disbursements of funds of that pen of that pension. That's a little technical. So if you're just an employee, the question is, should you go into a personal pension? Um, and the, the answer is exactly the same as, as, as Sean's right there. Yes, you can. <clears throat> but going into a personal pension, you should be comparing how much you're paying in your auto enrollment um, fund because the auto enrollment will be capped at an amount in terms of charges. Whereas if you, if you move to a personal pension arrangement, what are you moving to? Why are you moving? Is it because, well, there's not a lot of choice in the auto enrollment. If that is the case, why do you think that? 
have you actually checked with the administrator? Because if the administrator is someone like Aegon, there's tons of choice. If the administrator is someone like Legal and General, there is tons of choice. So have you actually had a look at all of the options that are available? You may have. I, just, I don't know this. I'm just throwing it out there. But it's worthwhile just speaking to the administrator, seeing what they actually have available, looking at their cost structure as well. Because the last thing you want is to go from an auto-enrollment into something else that you will probably might end up paying more money for and then you're not happy where you are anyway. I know that there is a lot of um, information on YouTube about, you know, um, personal pensions and SIPs and all this kind of stuff. You don't have to have one if you have a really, really good auto-enrollment pension. You don't have to have one. So please just bear that in mind. And if you are going to, you know, put money into a SIP or transfer, move money from your company auto-enrollment into um, a SIP as well, then you you need to have a look at cost, past performance, an exact measurement and a comparison of what you're moving to. Those things become really, really important. So I would say speak to your administrator first, find out who the administrator is. Because like I said, if you've, if you're, if you've got Aegon or legal in general, there are tons of choice in terms of funds with both of those if, they're, if they are your administrator, but you need to find out who it is first. I'm just scanning. Bear me one second. Brandon. Brandon, how you doing? Hi, Pete. How are you? Hope you're well. Uh, I just got your book, but haven't managed to read it yet. Um, thank you, dude. Um, thanks for, for picking up the book. I did mention last Friday. I think, was it Friday or maybe a Thursday or so? I'm actually thinking of doing a book club for everyone who has actually purchased the book because this is the feedback that I've been getting. I've bought the book. I've not got round to reading it just yet so the idea behind the book club is we will do it maybe over four maybe six weeks and we will take you I will take you through the book and I will take you through all of the exercises in the book and help you get the best out of the the strategies that I share in the book effectively so that's something that I'm thinking of launching in the next maybe two three weeks or so so if you think that might be useful, mate, <clears throat> can you do me a favor? Can you message me on LinkedIn, um, on Instagram, and just say, look, you'll be interested in the book club. And what I'll do, what I want to do is maybe get a group of 10, maybe 20 people. And what we we'll do is we'll meet up every week. It might be on a, a Sunday evening or, or something like that. It'll be an hour. I'll task you with reading a section of the book. We'll have a WhatsApp group. In the WhatsApp group, I'll send out the exercise for the week. So we'll cover all of the five key areas, budgeting, avoiding debt, saving early, investing early and credit score. So I'll give you homework for each of those bits and pieces. So by the time we end the, the book club specifically, you would have gone through all of the exercises. You would have been able to embed all of the principles that I put up in the book. So that may help you actually getting around to it. But I appreciate you buying the book. And for anyone who hasn't actually already picked up the book already, I'm so crap at talking about this because I don't know. I don't know why, but I just really, really am. If you scan the uh, QR code, which is literally just there, um, you can pick up the book. It's uh, available in physical. It's available in audio uh, as a podcast, like audio book. And it's also available as a Kindle uh, printout as well. Um, the feedback and the, the reviews have been amazing. They're really, really amazing. And to think that people are still buying the book today is, is pretty good. But I think it's also quite timely given everything that we're going through at the moment with a reset with interest rates and so on and so forth. So if you do want to get it, scan the QR code and uh, it will take you through to Amazon where you can pick up a copy. If you do want to sign copy, you can also just message me on um, Instagram because I do have some copies over there which I can uh, pull out and uh, send you a signed copy. So if you're interested, let me know. Cheers, Brandon. Jade is asking, hi, Pete. Is it true that I have to create a will to protect my ISA due to ISAs not ha having the options of beneficiaries? <clears throat> you really should have a will. Um, if you've got people that you want to leave the money to, then yes, you should have a will. A will is a very easy way for you to basically um, to protect it. Beneficiaries. If you have a stock and shares ISA, though, you can nominate beneficiaries, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. On a cash ISA, maybe not. 
but I would generally say it's, it's good practice to have a will. Generally speaking, I've in my 15 years working in financial services and certainly for the years that I worked in wealth management, which was eight years combined over that period of time, advising people as well during that period of time. One of the worst things that I've seen is where people die without a will and it's called dying with the term is intestate. And what that basically means is that the state gets to decide where your money goes. Now, it may not necessarily be too bad if you are if you've never been married, but I've I certainly witnessed um, a case once where a couple were married for a very long time. They broke up um, during the breakup and then the process of, of being divorced. They both each separated. And by the way, this was not a an amicable proceeding at all. It was very 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 toxic right so they've separated still in the process of getting divorced they've each found you know new partners so the husband in this equation then remarries has a kid divorce is strung out well didn't get married but he was with a new partner has a kid with a new partner divorce is still strung out he dies now obviously because there was a toxic breakup he wanted obviously some of his assets to go to his new partner and the kid that he's had with the new partner. And the rules of intestate basically meant that the ex-wife, well, the to be ex-wife basically gets everything. So it can get very, 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 very messy. Where you think uh, money will go isn't necessarily where it goes all of the time. Um, it's not something that it's just, it's just not. So just do a will. You can do wills for really cheap online these days. I would argue that if you want a really good will done, a solid will done, you need to get a professional to do it for you. It may cost a few hundred quid, but it's definitely worthwhile doing and just having it there so you can also update it as you as you go along. Uh, Jedi Mills is saying he's definitely interested in the book club. That is noted. Thank you very much. Clinton, hi, Pete. I believe nearly, I nearly have enough. Okay, for deposit. Have I've, I've done this one already? Mm. Uh, hang on a second are you filling in information here Clinton one second I think I've covered this one already Clinton cheers to that Brandon good man thank you very much I'm just uh, scanning through here so guys if you do have questions this will be the time to pop them in the chat and I'll get to each of them uh, as we go along. Um, just as a little reminder, if you could remember, if you are getting value from, from the stream, uh, remember to tap the like button. It just means that the YouTube algorithm will recommend this to somebody else who may benefit from uh, some of the questions that are being asked uh, by you guys because they might be in the same position. And it's it's really, really weird to say, but this is the these are the quirks of the YouTube algorithm. They go on by how many people watch the video by how many people actually like and communicate with the video and if it has a very very low count they just go well nobody enjoyed that they killed the video in terms of other people seeing it so it only takes a second but it really does help the channel it also helps other people as well um hear what we're speaking about here as well so thank you um really good question so we have covered this last week um but thanks for joining here so our interest set to rise again, interest rates set to rise again. Yes, we are apparently going to see another two interest rate rises by the end of this year. Um, so the bank rate at the moment is 5.25%. The top line for uh, the interest rate that we're going to see is rumored to be about 575 So we've still got a half a percent interest rise, interest rate rise to go at some point between now and the end of the year. The, the consensus is we'll see another rate rise in September, and then one will follow at some point afterwards. But obviously, and I said this on Friday, that a lot of this is going to be predicated on the inflation numbers doing what the forecast is suggesting. Um, and there are still reasons why that may not be the case. So, Two is what we're accounting for, and that should be the end of it if all goes to plan. Um, and so I think there is maybe a little bit of a silver lining here uh, in terms of people who have mortgages, 
we're probably at the top of where we are in terms of mortgage rates right now, unless something drastically changes. I haven't seen um, over the past couple of days any um, notable increase in mortgage rates. I've not seen any. That may change come tomorrow, but I've not seen any. So it feels as though mortgage rates on the high street have kind of stood still because where we were supposed to be at 6% at the B and the top is no longer the case. 5.75 is now the max. So I think maybe a lot of the mortgage rates had factored in 6% and now that we're not going to meet there, there's not going to be any more interest rate rises on the mortgage front. But we will wait and see. That's Time will tell effectively. But yeah, there will be likely another two by the end of this year. David, um, just finished listening to the audiobook. Was it your choice to voice it? May yes, it was. <laughs> um, I had the option, um, because obviously I'm with Harper Collins for this. Um, they gave me the option of either having someone voice it for me, and I just felt like because obviously in the book I'm telling part of my story, and my story ties in very closely to the obviously the five principles in the basic formula, right? I just didn't feel it would be right if someone else was telling my story, like the way I introduced myself in the book. It just wouldn't be right, especially because people watch me and listen to me on the podcast and watch me here on YouTube. Like you guys know what I sound like. It would just, it would have been weird. So yeah, I, it was, it was my choice to, um, to make sure that I, that I voiced it. And it took, it took about three days to record. It was painstaking to say the least. And um, it was shortly after that, that I actually took, um, I took a test because I found the reading of the book and the delivery of the book a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And because I've been doing some stuff on TV and I used to read from teleprompter, the way my head works, my head, when I see a sentence, my head looks at the words and I connect the words and then I know what the, the sentence says without really reading it. And it was, it was so much worse when I was reading my own words because I wrote the book. So in my head, when I'm reading it back, I know what I wrote, but I'm not reading exactly what's on the page. And you have to read it word for word. You can't ad lib, you can't, you know, add words here and there. And that was a real point of contention. And so after I finished the recording, I actually took a, a dyslexia test and I found out that I'm actually mildly dyslexic. Um, so that was very, very eye opening. But yeah, it was my choice. Uh, Missy London is saying here, um, will save, savings rise again? Yes, they will. So we're going to see uh, the savings rates increase probably from tomorrow, if they haven't already. We'll start to see that come through. And with another half a percent due to come before the end of the year, savings rates will go up. So I made a video on Friday, um, obviously talking about there are accounts right now which will help you beat inflation. That will be inflation, uh, given everything going according to plan that's going to be even more so the case when we get to 5.75% on the Bank of England base rate. And if inflation does have that downward trajectory with, that they're hoping for, it's the first time in maybe a decade and a half that saviors will be able to get their money to work tangibly for them. So yeah, it's good news on that front for, for saviors. Nikki is just asking here, hi Pete, if you were looking to save for your first home within the next couple of years, what tips would you give? Um, have you looked into AI assisted investing? Okay. So if you're looking to um, save for deposit in two years, you need to steer away from investing. The risk is way too high. Um, AI assisted investing. I've looked into it because I was going to do a series on the channel. Um, where I was going to put maybe some of my own money into some of these AI recommendations. I couldn't find one that was reliable, that I thought didn't also look like a scam. Because the thing is, there are AI sites popping up everywhere. Everything's AI now, everything, even if it's not AI. So you need to be a little bit careful in that to make sure that you don't automatically just land into the lap of a bunch of scammers who have been very, very clever with this AI offering that will return 
X amount per month, blah, blah, blah. You want to stay away from it. Generally speaking, if you want to save for your house in two years, stay away from investing. The risk is too high, mate. Honestly. And I know that may not be palatable, but like, it's not worth the risk, mate. Because at the end of the day, you've only got two years, which means that if you go and put a lump sum, £5,000 into it, and the next two years are horrible. I mean, the economy in the UK is set to pretty much be on a plateau. You know, the US, yes, the S&P 500 is doing okay, but that's mainly driven by AI stocks, mainly from what I've been able to see. Um, if that bubble just kind of like bursts, then what happens? You've got two years, so 24 months to turn your, what, 5K into what exactly? Being your deposit. 10K? To double it in two years. Doesn't happen, mate. It really, really doesn't happen. So please be careful, especially if you're going to be looking at AI-assisted investing. I couldn't find anything that didn't look like a scam. Um, and that's just me being honest. And that's why I've not done this series on on the channel, because I was very, very interested to experiment and see okay, is there something reliable that I would feel comfortable putting my own money into personally to ensure that, you know, if I made a, a series around this, number one, you guys will get rid of you from it. And number two, I'm not being irresponsible in talking about a site or a service that could ultimately end up being a scam. I lose money, yes, but it would be even worse if someone else lost money because it's something that I featured on the channel. I'm always very, very picky when it comes to that. You know, if if I were you, what I would be doing is put whatever money you have into like a lifetime ISA. You know, it's a guaranteed 20, 25% return from the government. That is the easiest thing for you to do without a doubt. And that's into a cash lifetime ISA. Get the 25% from the government and then just use that mate that would be my that would be my my advice sophie 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 i don't i don't need to move now should i wait and for how long really good question sophie um i think look there will be a lot of people on online telling you you should do this you should do this you should do that I think that you should just block out everybody and ask what you think you should do. If you don't need to move and you're comfortable with waiting and waiting is going to give you enough time maybe to put more money aside and you feel comfortable in that, that's what you should do. If you are under pressure to move, which you're not, then that's a completely different kettle of fish. It's a completely different conversation. You've got to think about what, what is comfortable for you. What do you want to do? Don't worry about what people are telling you down the pub or your friends are telling you or your family are telling you or what YouTube or podcasts are telling you. Because there's a lot of stuff that you can hear on podcasts. Whilst a lot of it is very, very good in terms of information, there's also a lot of um, FUD out there. Like, don't, 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 if you don't act now, you're going to miss out on the opportunity of a lifetime. Like, no, like seriously. Yes, it might be. Circumstances will change. Circumstances might change for the better. We don't know that just yet. None of us got a crystal ball. So think about what you want to do. You know, you're not under any pressure. If you're okay to wait, you've got, you know, enough time to put more money aside. And I think really, if you look at it from a numbers point of view, that isn't a bad thing. Waiting, coming up with a bigger deposit, that's a good thing right now, especially with mortgage rates. It really, really is because the bigger your deposit, the better the rate you're going to get on the mortgage. And if you think about this affordability, so I did a video about um, how banks really look at your mortgage application, how they score it from an affordability point of view. There were six things they look at. Having a bigger deposit is massively going to help you. Um, on the affordability side to the mortgage as well. So, you know, don't feel under pressure that because people are telling you that you should be doing something. They, you know, there is no should. What do you want to do? What is right for you? Oh, that's okay. So you're saying here, I thought uh, we may have seen the last rise this month. No, unfortunately not. <laughs> unfortunately not. 
um, yeah, we're going to be looking at 5.75. So, all right, hi P. Are there any calculators that would be able to compare salary sacrifice versus high rate tax relief for pensions? I've heard the former is more effective. Would be good to see the numbers. I don't know of any calculators at the minute. No, um, I don't. I can't think of any. If you does. I don't know if I saw one on legal and gen general. It would have been a while ago, though, if they did have one. I can't quite remember. If, if anyone does have one, if you if you Googled it, if anyone does have one, I would imagine it would be one of the big providers, like a legal and general or someone like that. But I can't think of one off the top of my head that will be available to the general public. You know, if I was still advising um, and I still had access to the suite of tools that you have access to as a as an advisor, I would be able to probably get you a calculation. But I don't know one that is available to uh, members of the general public. Um, yeah, so sorry, mate. I, I can't really point you in any any direction there. Oh, this is good. Uh, NatWest, Halifax, Virgin Money, all slash mortgage rates now, apparently, and many other banks followed suit. That's good. I mean, we need that for sure. Because, um, and, and this is the thing, because I've been, I've been talking about the fact that over the, if you have a fixed rate that is ending in six months, right? So let's just say you fix. So for example, I fixed in at 4.75. If mortgage rates were to come down to say four and a half percent, right? And my lender had a, a mortgage at four and a half percent and I've locked in at 4.75, I could still, before my mortgage, the new mortgage kicks in in October at 4.75, go on to the four and a half percent rate, which is why it's important for people to be proactive when you're looking at mortgages and stuff. So I don't think we're going to see a, a significant reduction per se, because I think the average two year fixed rate was something like 6.86 or something like that. So I'm hoping it will come down to maybe six, six and a half. I need to have a look at it because this, this will be a video for maybe tomorrow, Monday, a live session once I've um, dug into some of the numbers and stuff and seen what's out there. But the fact that they haven't raised them is good. The fact that it's coming down means that they already pre-priced in a lot of this stuff when all, all of us were panicking about, you know, the bank rate possibly going up to 6%. So this is good. But I think the new norm for mortgages and mortgage rates will probably be in the in the four and a half, maybe 5% once all of this has died down and maybe interest rates have come down in maybe 18 months, two years time. But I think, you know, this is the norm at the moment, but this is good. I will have a look at this, um, this article on This Is Money. Thank you for that, Missy London. Oh, dude, thank you very much. I did a great, did a great job on the, on the audio book. It added a lot to hear it. Um, hear it how you intended. No, thank you, mate. Seriously, it was so stressful. By the third day, I was like, please just get me the hell out of here. Because it's, and obviously, because I'm a bit of a perfectionist as well. It's the, it's not just reading. Yes, you need to read and get that right. But you also need to get the tone right. So the inflections, and that was one of the things that I was really, really excited about doing is because I've heard uh, audio books where it's like, um, this is the money basics chapter one and it's just monotonous and i was like if i do an audio book like that just throw me off a cliff right now so i wanted it to i wanted you to hear my enthusiasm because at the end of the day we're talking about money it's, it's already kind of a bit of a boring kind of like topic right but because i'm also sharing my story i wanted you guys to be able to to feel um that in in the way it was delivered as well so this is really really good to good to hear thank you mate Graham, great advice there, mate. Well done. Well done, well done, well done. Brandon said, I'm thinking about contributing less in my ISA due to the life, uh, LISA, due to lifetime uh, ISA allowance, not increasing against the rise in house prices, living down south, not London. Um, mate, listen, you need to max out the, ISA, the LISA. £4,000, you can't control the fact that it's not gone up, but you need to max it out. Don't have a four thousand pound allowance and then only paying two grand 
you're doing yourself a disservice. You're robbing yourself of money. So paying the full amount and then, you know, put the rest the rest of it into something else. A cash ISA. Maybe. NSI premium bombs. Maybe. As an option. Because tax that tax free environment is also very important. Because why pay twenty percent of whatever you gain when you're trying to save towards a house? Every every penny, every pound is gonna help you. So make sure you max out the four K in your in your lifetime ISA. All right, guys, just a little reminder, please, if you can, please don't forget to tap the like button, especially if you are getting some some useful tips or you're enjoying this. It will really help the channel, really help me, really help the algorithm push this to other people who may also need to, to hear some of the conversations that we're having here as well. It only takes a second to do it. I know it can be annoying. YouTube is asking you to smash the like button, but it is for a reason. It just means that other people will get to uh, get to benefit from this as well. Right, let's, uh, where was I? Okay, I was there. Ah, someone from the Americans. Okay, I have seen the 30-year fixed rate mortgage lock people into their houses, but I hear that your mortgages are two to three years adjustables. This is affecting your, Is the, how is this affecting your real estate market? You know what? In the UK, because of our, our interest rate curve historically, it made sense to go into a two to five year um, adjustable, as you call it, right? Fixed rate period. Um, I wouldn't say that this negatively impacts our our estate, uh, our real estate market per se, because it's it's part of our real estate market, right? We don't lock into 20, 25, 30 year fixed term uh mortgages we just don't do that so i'm not a property expert i don't think it's impacted our real estate market in any way shape or form because it is it's it's the norm for us we lock in for two years five years we renegotiate and because of our interest rate curve from the 1970s when our interest rates were in the double digits you know people were very very comfortable going from you know a fixed rate at two two percent maybe to 5% or maybe 5% down to 4% because we knew roughly where our interest rates were. It just so happens over the last 10 years, though, um, what we found is that we've had really low interest rates and mortgages have been extremely cheap. We're now coming off the other side of that with mortgages now being really the average being, as of last week, 6.6 or something like that. And now fixing for 10 years, 15 years is maybe a little bit more attractive because of the interest rate curve proje projections. Um, but it's always been the case that we've always had very, very short-term adjustables here um, in, in the UK. Y you guys in America are just used to locking it in. And I can see what you're saying. It locks people into their houses. I can get that 100%, but we've never really had that thing here. Hi, Pete. First time buyer and mortgage offer valid till November at 5.2%. Not bad. What's your loan to value? Price agreed in July, but feel now overpriced by 15, 20K. If I was able to renegotiate lower price, would I need to reapply for a new mortgage? Um, you agreed this in July. June, July. No, you should be okay. You should be okay. I mean, the, the the lender will decide ultimately. But I think if you feel like it's overpriced and, you know, you'll be paying over 15, 20 grand, you should definitely ask, like, listen, prices have gone down locally. Can we renegotiate the, the sale price? For sure. Um, the lender will then decide. As long as you, generally speaking, as long as you're not borrowing more, where the risk for the lender becomes higher than it was prior, you should be okay. But because you're borrowing less, it, should, it shouldn't it should need for you to reapply because your affordability becomes better because you're potentially lending 15, 20 grand less than what you were originally going to. So you should be okay. Um, but speak to the lender and just say to the guys, look, we think that we can get a discount on this house now because of the, the market. Uh, what do you think? And just let them guide you, mate. But congratulations, mate. I mean, 5.2%. It's not bad. Not bad at all. I'm 
I'm just scanning. Bear me one second. Mm. Oh, this is a good one. I didn't know this. Only found out yesterday that my lender RBS is up their overpayment allowance from 10% to 20%. That's pretty good. That's really, really good. You're going to be taking advantage of that, mate. I would, for sure. I've got a chunk coming off my mortgage, uh, hopefully in the next two to three weeks, um, which I'm going to be paying off, which, yeah, seeing a chunk of cash disappear isn't that great. But at the same time, it's for the it's for the greater good. I'm going to feel, uh, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to feel. <laughs> oh, I know I'm going to feel <clears throat> when I see the money leave my account. When I look at my mortgage balance, I think I feel, I will feel positive in the fact that, oh, you know, maybe that's been put to good use could have invested it these are the choices that you make that become so difficult right um, if my mortgage offer expires in november but i need to extend simply to allow more time to see if rate drops before completion on the property is it something i can request or not possible not really mate if you're going to complete if you withdraw your mortgage application you're going to have to start again. And if rate to go up and they no longer have that rate available, mate, you'll be stuck with a higher rate. So I, what I would do is see the process through under the current application, but just ask them and say, look, is the rate that you still have still the best that you have? Go and touch on their website, do all of that, right? Because the thing is, if you've already been, you've already gone through the application process, so you've already been credit scored, if you stop that in the hopes that rates go down and they don't, you're going to start a new application and you're going to be credit scored again. And that first one potentially goes against you in the application process. So you've got to play it. You've got to play it cute here. Really, really cute. The best thing you can do, speak to your provider and just, you know, try and get them to really talk you through the options and ask, you know, is this still your best rate? I've been looking at the market. There's this rate available and just try and have that dialogue with them. That's what I would do. Someone's just saying here, yeah, that is true. You do, if you're doing um, kind of like a salary sacrifice, you also chair, uh, save national insurance contributions as well, what the company does anyway. Uh, Bernard, not mortgage related, but any good pension providers you know of to maybe consolidate my pensions. I got a bunch scattered all, all over the place. There are quite a few, mate. You've got the likes of Moneybox, you've got Wealthify, you've got Money Farm, you've got Pension B. Um, if I had to pick out of the two, only because I know the two companies really well, um, I know the, the guys behind the company. So I know Andy Russell at Wealthify. And I also know the guys at Pension B extremely well. I would recommend those two. And I'll recommend those two and do a comparison, right? So just don't take my word for it. Go to the Pension B website, go to the Wealthify website, compare their costs. But I, I recommend those two because I know you'll get a really good service. They really, really care about what they do. And they're, they're both amazing companies. And it's not often that you get to, you know, sit down with someone who heads up a financial services company and he's just a normal dude. That's Andy Russell at Wealthify. Equally, if you think of Romy, who started Pension B, I mean, I did a roadshow talk for them uh, a couple of months ago in Birmingham. She showed up for the evening. Like she's the head of that business, the head of that company. So yeah, check out those two. Those are the two that I would recommend because they're really, really good as businesses and as people in the business as well. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> you've got a really good deal, mate. You, you've got a 95% loan to value mortgage and you were what? 5.2%. Mate. That's a really good rate. I don't even know, mate, you would not get that rate right now. That's a really good rate. That's a very, very, very good rate for a 95% loan to value. I'll be very, very surprised if you got if you found that on the market right now, sub six. I'll be very, very surprised. So, mate, you got a good one there. You really, really did. Uh, that's my camera. Ah, how annoying is that? Mm. All right. There's lots and lots of other comments on here. Apologies, guys. 
but my camera's going to die, which means I've got to call this short. Um, it is plugged in. It's weird. I, wa I was using it earlier because I had a, a, a meeting beforehand, um, which I've been using it on. So anyway, guys, thank you so much. Apologies I can't carry on because I would have done. Um, but I, I think I was pretty much down to the bottom of the, of the, of the comments anyway. Thank you so much for watching. Um, there'll be more videos uh, tomorrow and through the week. I'll have a look at the mortgage rate, see what's going on there. So please come and join in there. Again, if you've not tapped the like button just yet, please consider doing so. I appreciate you. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening. I will catch you next week. Yeah. Surprise, a little different than you're used to. Yeah. Dropping these bars on YouTube. Knowledge I introduce you. Yeah. We chasing this money like it's the prize. It's the voodoo. From Gazy, from Gazi, it's just the lie we buying into. Ah, yeah. We need some cars on deck. Get yeah. the rollies, get the moe, all the Mars on deck. Yeah. We got the traders. Yeah, check. Got the picture with the Bentley in Dubai. Yeah, check. Why you dripping in designer looking fly? Yeah, on the bombardier, sipping on the wine. Yeah, check. Check. Broke man, we broke. Where's the fun in being broke? Stocks and bonds get you yo. That's what I'm teaching these folks. I see that smoke, see them choke. Getting coke, getting coke. While I'm researching these stocks, buying coke, buying coke. 20 months on the channel, million people taking note. I got a warrant for buffet. I'm coming.